that was uh, far too kind. So thank you very much for that. And um, hope I don't disappoint. And we have a, a range of expertises here today from, from uh, you know, relatively new trainees to hardened old crusty locust experts. So uh, the pressure's on. When it's trainees, I can just make stuff up, right? But the pressure's on to get it right here now. So let's see how we do. Uh, I was asked to, am I sharing my screen? No. There we go. All right, I was asked to give a crash course on, on behavioral phase change. So that's what I've put together for us today. And the structure, we're gonna walk through the basics of plasticity, um, not necessarily directly related to locusts, but of course, um, one of the overall goals of the BPRI is to um, put what has, has typically been a relatively narrow um, field, at least in terms of the number of, of investigators and in the, the, the focus, which is behavioral phase change, and put it in the much broader context of phenotypic plasticity in, in the sort of modern study of biology. Um, along with that, though, I think there are, there are some important caveats about locusts and, and the expression of, of behavioral phase change or plasticity that, that we should acknowledge and consider when we're trying to, to interpret um, for instance, the adaptive significance of, of some of the traits, including behavior. So then we're going to jump into behavioral phase change. And I decided to take a, a kind of teach the classics approach. So we're going to go through a few of, of um, what I consider to be at least the, um, some of the more important, relatively modern papers, um, not to discount the, the older work, but there are a few influential ones that continue to influence the field today. Um, then we're going to go from individual-based locust behavior to studying locust behavior at the group level, which is collective movement or, of course, famous locust swarming. So plasticity, hopefully everybody knows this by now, the definition of plasticity. There's a bunch out there, but they basically center around an individual genotype being able to produce uh, multiple phenotypes uh, mediated by the environment. And uh, it's a widespread phenomenon. Uh, we're studying it in, in the context of locusts, but of course it occurs um, uh, just throughout an incredibly wide range of, of animals and plants and, and other life forms. So I wanted to throw in a few key concepts in plasticity for our students. As you're starting to read papers about phenotypic plasticity, you might come across some terms or some context um, um, concepts. And of course, We've got our very own specific terms and concepts that are relevant to locusts. And as I mentioned, we're trying to, to place locust plasticity in a broader context. So this is really intended to be some, some broad introductory um, information. So what we've got is a concept of a reaction norm. And a reaction norm is simply a depiction of a phenotype and how it varies in response to the environment. So we've got some measure of the phenotype on the y-axis here and some measure of the environment on the x-axis. And this blue line plots what that particular phenotype being expressed by that organism is at any particular environment. And you can envision doing an experiment on, on a bunch of organisms or, or let's say clones of any one genotype and, and plotting out what that mean phenotype might be across all the environments, right? It might be different in different environments, but you could go ahead and calculate what the animal's mean phenotype is across environments. And plasticity is technically considered the deviation of, of what's expressed, whoa, what's expressed in a given environment relative to the mean phenotype, right? So we've got a reaction norm that depicts how different phenotypes are produced across different environments. And plasticity is a, a measure, if you will, of how much that phenotype differs from the mean phenotype across all environments. Now, when we talk about reaction norms, it's also important to realize that, that they're not all linear. So this nice straight line right here means for, you know, for every incremental change in whatever the environment is that we're looking at, could be density, but it could be temperature, whatever, that there's a similar incremental change in the phenotype, but that doesn't have to be the case. So you can have reaction norms that are shaped like this one, which is more of a threshold change, right? A little bit of change in the environment causes a lot of change in the phenotype. And then it's important to recognize what a, what a reaction norm is when an organism does not express plasticity. 
That means that it expresses the same phenotype regardless of what the environment looks like, right? And in that case, the, the trait is just strictly under genetic control. There's no environmental component whatsoever. Okay, so that's just a little bit of background on that. So now we'll jump into locus. And of course, this slide hopefully should not have any new information for anyone involved in the BPRI at this point. Um, um, we're talking about today behavior, but there are, of course, lots of other changes um, depending on the species um, that might vary with population density. Um, hopefully we're all familiar with the concept of, of isolated organisms um, expressing what we could refer to as a solitarious phenotype or phase and those crowded individuals expressing the gregarious phase. Um, and importantly, where this concept is going to come up a couple times during our lecture today, in locus, the expression of phase polyphenism is correlated with swarming. And so if you remember the old saying, correlation does not imply causation, we're gonna talk about, about the, the evidence for a causal link or lack of an evidence for causal link in, in um, the process of gregorization and the ultimate manifestation of that in terms of swarms. So another really important context that I wanted to, to stress as we start to study plasticity and a particularly plasticity in locus and, and think about it in the scope of broader biology um, is this concept of, of Nico Tinbergen's four questions. So who is Nico Tinbergen? If you're not familiar, he's considered the father of modern animal behavior. And there is actually a direct connection to locus. So the, the University of Oxford Department of Zoology where the, uh, one of the, the largest major cultures of Schistocirca gregaria that was reared under isolated and crowded conditions in Steve Simpson's lab um, was housed, right? So it was housed in the, the, the Tinbergen building on the campus um, at the University of Oxford. And so um, what are Tinbergen's um, key questions here that he laid out that really provide a framework for people as they study uh, behavior, but not much really important, it, this isn't restricted to behavioral traits at all. It's really any trait that one wants to study. There are, there are different hypotheses or questions that one can com compose about that trait. And so one is, is what is its function? Or this is an adaptive hypothesis. So what is the current utility of a given behavior or trait, right? So what's it doing? Whoa, sorry about that. My mouse is super sensitive. Um, What's the function or what's the utility of that trait right now to the organism? But we can also think about that same trait in an evolutionary or a phylogenetic context, right? How did that trait evolve? How does it change um, from, from ancestor to, to current taxa? You can ask a causal question or a mechanistic question. How does that trait work, right? What, what, what causes that coloration to exist? Um, how is a certain um, morphological structure formed? Um, you can also, I guess I kind of bled into the second one here. You can also ask, how does, the, how does that trait develop? And it's important when you're testing hypotheses to, to really be explicit about which of these questions you're trying to ask or answer with your hypothesis. And, and I'll give you some examples, um, um, one in particular uh, later as we go on about why this is important. But I think this is a super important framework as we go on and try to explicitly develop hypotheses for the, 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 the function, if you will, of different density dependent traits, including behavior across species. So placing locus plasticity or, or what we'll just you know, refer to as phase polyphenism specifically um, in its proper ecological and evolutionary context is something that I think is important as well as we're trying to explain the different levels of Tinbergen's questions when it comes to plasticity. So one context is the temporal context. And this graph is just taken from a, a, a older paper about locusts and it's showing locust population dynamics and um, the different stages of, of outbreaks, if you will, that we have. But what's really most important to think of from a plasticity context is that outbreaks or these big plagues and outbreaks where locusts are everywhere, those are really rare over evolutionary time, okay? Most of the time, what we have are relatively small populations cycling up and down through sort of normal, normal population dynamics, right? It's only, locusts only become super abundant 
and, and start to swarm um, on a relatively rare um, frequency over evolutionary time. Now, we also wanna think about the, the spatial scale and the spatial context of where. So this is when our density dependent traits express, but there's also where our density dependent traits express. And so this is the case of um, an example of a distribution map for the desert locust that we'll talk about quite a bit today. And of course, as is going on right now, for instance, during a plague, its distribution might encompass an enormous area, what's referred to as the invasion area. But given that these are relatively rare events over the course of evolutionary time, most of the time, it actually can be quite hard to find desert locusts or, or individuals and or populations. And if you are to find them, you're not gonna find them out here in the invasion area, you're going to find them in what's referred to as the recession area. And even within the recession area, there are places where, it, it, where locusts are known to be more likely to be based on, on where outbreaks tend to originate in the recession area. So really, over, ecolo or over evolutionary timescales, most of the action is happening in these you know, relatively small populations here in the recession area. And, and plasticity is not being expressed in these huge outbreak, um, you know, swarm contexts in these populations. It's being expressed in the, in the form of, of generation to generation or year to year fluctuations in, in local population dynamics. So I'm not saying that traits expressed out here in the invasion area are irrelevant to the evolution of phase polyphenism, but that could certainly be a possibility, right? These, what's going on when we, we observe locusts in these big gigantic plagues um, could very well be, be irrelevant in terms of, of selection and evolution. Okay, so let's pop into studying locusts um, and plasticity. So these are some slides kindly provided by, by Hojin here to help put us in context with what we're trying to do in the BPRI. He's done some excellent work on the phylogenetics of, of Schistocerca, of course, of, of orthopterans much more broadly. But with respect to Schistocerca, um, we have a really good understanding of the phylogenetic relationships amongst taxa. And also, um, we don't need to go into that in particular, but also, um, again, courtesy of some work, recent work coming out of Hojin's lab, um, we have a much better understanding of the expression of plasticity by many species in this phylogeny. And so we, of course, have the, the desert locust as the, the basal taxa in Schistocerca, and, and we know that it expresses extreme density dependent changes um, in a lot of traits, but here we see those reaction norm diagrams again, right? So this is indicating a, a, a strong or a steep change in the phenotype with population density for behavior, like we're going to be talking about today, but also a similar reaction norm for color in the desert locust. But we also know that there are other swarming locust species in the genus, and they have independently evolved this propensity to swarm. And we also know that they also express relatively extreme phenotypic plasticity in behavior and color and, and probably other changes as we, other traits as we go to quantify them. Um, but we also know that there's a, a whole distribution of plasticity distributed throughout the genus um, on a species level. So some species express no evidence of plasticity, uh, changes in behavior or color, for example, with population density. Some may show some minor changes in color or, or maybe behavior and color. And then of course we have full-blown phase change. So this is really the, the foundation of what we, we as a BPRI have as a resource to ask questions about the adaptive significance of plasticity, but also its evolution um, and the mechanism, and of course, its development, if we remember those four questions of, of Nico Tinberg. So let's dive into phase change. Now, I, I opted to go for a, um, a teach the classics approach here, because from a student's perspective, what I was trying to do was teach some of the fundamental things that you might encounter if you go on to read some literature about locus phase change. And this paper here is from 1993. Uh, it was the, that was the year I started graduate school, for example. And, um, and I didn't understand this paper when it first came out. I'll freely admit that. I even knew a little bit about locusts, man, but this paper blew my mind. So this paper though, has gone on to influence uh, 
has just had a tremendous impact on how phase change is studied in, in locus, particularly behavioral phase change. And as you read papers, some of the methods and analysis techniques that were developed in this particular study are still used um, by our labs that study this here in the BPRI and other labs throughout the world. Uh, so that's, I thought it was important to kind of walk through this. You'll notice my graphic here. If you download this paper, if you go to the, to the proceedings website, um, the only way you can get it is as a scanned PDF of the original hard copy. So it's so old, they didn't even have the original digital file for it. They just had to scan it. Okay, and that's not that old, I'm not that old, but anyways, 1993. So what did they do? One of the first um, important contributions of that particular paper is they developed a, a assay. So a behavioral assay system that is still used today. We have it set up here at Texas A&M. It's set up in, in multiple labs around the world. The concept here, I have this labeled as automated because I pulled it from another talk. At the time that this assay was set up, it was not automated. Humans had to sit there, I did this, sit there and watch individual locusts for 10 or 12 minutes a shot for days on end to collect the data. Nowadays, we've automated it. So we hang a camera over it and, and we can take videos and we can do you know, digital video or video analysis, et cetera. But anyways, the core of the assay is the same. So we've got this behavioral arena here. Here's the side view, and this is a top view. And um, there are lights at the end that light up what we refer to as the stimulus chambers here at the end. So there's a perforated screen or perforated glass. Um, the the uh, a focal insect in the arena can, can see and smell individuals in these stimulus chambers um, but it can't come in physical contact with them, okay? And so the way the assay is conducted is this focal insect is gently introduced into the center of the assay through, a, literally through a, a big hypodermic syringe, and it pops up in the middle of the assay, and then we observe its behavior, and it can do a lot of things. Sometimes they do absolutely nothing. They don't move at all, um, but other times, for instance, a classic gregarious animal, they are, they're pretty active in the arena, and they tend to go over and will hang out closer to this stimulus group. A solitarious phase individual might come out and, and they don't move as much and these straight lines typically reflect jumping. So they'll jump around, but they don't really walk and, and they don't really express um, on average attraction to, to the conspecifics. So this is a video of, of how this works. Um, so there's a, this is a, where we set the assay up for the Australian plague locust, Cordycetes terminifera. It's a tiny little beast. And so we were able to set up two assays uh, simultaneously and they're both being videotaped in this case, but there the focal individual has been introduced and it was a, a crowded individual and right away, it walked right over and um, sort of exhibited classic gregarious phase um, behavior there, okay? So, What's, that's showing you what the animal does, but what are the data that come out of a uh, analysis like this? So that individual insect that's in the arena, its behavior is being tracked. In the case of this paper, as I mentioned in 93, humans were watching it and recording data on a little um, event recorder computer, but now we use things like ethovision that you might've heard of that tracks the movement and calculates all these variables. So these are the original variables that were pulled from the, the 1993 paper. And there are things like X distance. That's the distance from the stimulus group, the average distance over time that the insect was observed from the stimulus group. And then these are just other things that you can calculate about um, movement of an, of an organism, how straight it tended to walk, how fast it walked, turn frequency, um, you know, the total time that it spent walking, et cetera. And you could stop there if you wanted. At this point now, you've got a lot of, of, for every individual that you ran through your assay, you've got the you know, values for these behaviors. You might choose to do a, a multivariate comparison at this point between your two groups of insects. Let's just say for locust, it's isolated and crowded. Um, you could do a MANOVA, multivariate analysis of variance if you wanted. But one of the key innovations of this particular study is they didn't stop there. They went on and they used what's called logistic regression modeling to, to develop a, an equation. It's a model, but it's, you know, in mathematical terms, that's just an, an equation that predicts based on any individual's behavior in the arena, what phase, what behavioral phase 
it is in. And the way that works here is, is it takes these same variables that they collected and you, you run them through a, a stepwise logistic regression procedure. You know, nobody does this by hand, really. It's all done in, in a computer. But what ultimately comes out in, in the model, the variables that are retained are those models that are, 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 are most um, strongly predictive of being either in the gregarious phase or the solitarious phase. OK, so these are the model, the, the variables um, that were retained in the model. All these were originally put in it. But these were the ones that were, were shown to be most predictive. And what you can do is when you have values for those behaviors now, you can plug them into this equation up here and actually compute the probability that any one individual that expressed whatever the values of these behaviors were um, is in the solitarious behavioral phase or the gregarious behavioral phase. So it's called a binary logistic regression model and it's predicting a binary outcome. You're either in this group or in this group. And so the really nice thing, convenient, at least for depending on your hypothesis, of course, is that the binary logistic regression model collapses down all those different behaviors that an organism expressed into a single variable. And that single variable, you're going to see it in a lot of papers, is, is referred to usually as, as the probability of being solitarious or, or abbreviated as PSOL sometimes, or the probability of being gregarious um, um, abbreviated as PGREG. And, and these are, are directly corresponding to each other, you know, mathematically. So if you see it in one paper and you want to think about it in terms of uh, written one way and you want to think about it in terms of another way, the probability of being in the solitarious phase is just one minus the probability of being in a gregarious phase, right? So you either want, have a probability of one, yes, you're solitarious, then you have a zero probability of being gregarious. Okay, so let's take a look at their data. This is the data um, expressed in terms of the probability of being solitarious. And they, they ran insects through their, um, after generating this behavioral model, they then ran an independent group of insects through their behavioral assay quantified all those behaviors that we saw there um, in, the, in the previous slide. And then for every individual, they were able to use those behaviors and calculate what that individual's probability of being in the solitarious phase was. Now for their crowded animals, these are, are ones that came from their rearing colony. They've been crowded for multiple generations. What we see here is this is the frequency of locusts and this is their, their probability value down here of being solitarious. So long-term crowded animals have, most of them have a, a very low probability of being in solitarious phase. That means they're in the gregarious phase and that's what we would expect for crowded animals, okay? Um, so now we go down to, to B. These are locusts that had been reared in isolation. So taken from this crowded colony, reared in isolation for one generation and then run through the model and then have their probability um, calculated. And what we see here is a shift. So in this case, this distribution is very different than this distribution, right? We're starting to see a lot of insects that are, are, have a probability of um, being solitarious of one, right? So they're starting to solitarize over one generation. But notice we still have some individuals that have a very low, even after being isolated for one generation, a low probability of being solitarious. And so they did it, they isolated this generation again for a second generation. And we see that the effects getting a little bit stronger, right? A higher frequency of individuals that are, are expressing a, a probability of close to one of being solitarious, but it's still not, gregar gregariousness still isn't completely gone. So they ran another generation in isolation. And we still see now a pretty strong tail that's sort of opposite to this distribution where, where the good majority of the individuals and relatively few are, 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 have a high probability of being gregarious. So this is evidence of epigenetics, right? Transgenerational effects, which is another key thing that we're, we're continuing to study here in the BPRI. So hopefully that was illustrative of how we collect individual behavioral variables on focal insects using that arena setup and, and can then use that data in a number of ways, either directly if, if we wanna just compare specific focal behaviors, or we can summarize those behaviors using logistic regression um, and log logistic regression modeling 
to come up with a single predictor variable that we can then use in analyses like this to compare treatment groups of, you know, for instance, isolated and crowded or, or um, you know, multiple generations in isolation. Okay, so you're going to see not just in this lecture, but as you go on to read papers about behavioral phase change, I, I guarantee you, you're going to come across this logistic regression and um, this concept of, of the probabilities of being solitarious or gregarious phase. It's widely used. So, um, so far, well, let's just say that we have these swarming locust species and, and it's, a, it's a pretty wide held assumption that they're expressing density dependent phase polyphenism, right? Density dependent changes in behavior. But strictly speaking, it's only been confirmed in terms of quantified in, in empirical assays using you know, arenas like this in five species. So there's my, Locusta migratoria, uh, Terminifera is the Australian plague locust, Gregaria, Pisifrons, and Cancellata. So there are, there are several species that who, who um, at least in terms of publication, um, they, they haven't been empirically tested yet in this type of arena setup. Nevertheless, though, um, amongst those species that have been studied, we do get a pretty stereotypical behavior across species, right? A, a stereotypical suite of behaviors that change with density. And so this is just the example from, from the plague locust, but you, you're, if you plotted the data from, from Schistocirca gregario or from locusta, um, you're gonna see very similar uh, behavioral profiles. So what we tend to see amongst crowded insects versus those reared in isolation is that Overall, the isolated insects in the solitary phase, they're relatively inactive, right? So, for instance, variables like walk time or distance from the stimulus group or their speed, they're just not moving much. And relatively, the, the crowded insects are much more active, right? They're spending more time walking, they're walking farther and they're walking faster. And then this is a measure of their position. So these are activity related variables. This is a position related variable, right? The percent of time near the stimulus group. And again, we see the crowded ones, they're, they're gregarious, they're attracted to conspecific, so they spend more time near the stimulus group than the, the isolated ones. And this is very stereotypical um, behavior across species. Importantly, when you're thinking about behavioral phase change, it's important to consider simultaneously both activity and attraction behaviors though. So you can, you can easily envision a case where if you just did an assay and it was based on, on studying the activity alone of an animal, for instance, there are a lot of things that could affect the activity of a locust, right? One could just be um, maybe it, its level of, um, of satiation from feeding, right? Hungry locusts might move around more than uh, a, a well-fed locust having nothing to do with, with its rearing density. And so the, 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 the picture that has emerged is that to, for a metric to properly encapsulate behavioral phase change, it has to include components of both activity and attraction. Okay, one really important concept about behavioral phase change in the context of, of behavioral polyphenism more broadly in locus is that behavior changes first. So amongst the, the species that show behavioral changes in lots of traits like color or morphology, behavior changes very rapidly. Like in some cases, behavior can change from solitarius to gregarious in just a matter of hours, whereas color um, might come only after the next molt. Um, morphological changes might, um, might compound even over generations by, by epigenetic effects, okay? But behavior is really the first thing to go. And of course, remember there are some locusts that, that don't um, express any, any obvious changes in any traits other than behavior. Um, so behavior really changes first and then enables or promotes um, further crowding. And we'll talk about how that can be. Um, but also by, by further crowding, then we get the expression of all these other phase traits. And then of course, the ultimately manifesting in mass movement or swarming and the, the associated ecological impacts with that. And so this is a figure from, from one of the more recent um, holistic reviews of phase polyphenism. And it's no accident that behavioral phase change is down here on the bottom of this figure, right? You see the, the arrows from behavioral phase change and then the cascading effects that go on um, from there. 
So another point I want to make um, about this particular figure, though, is what's going on here in the green box, right? The, 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 the ecology box, if you will. Um, soil quality, I can't, my screen is, I got people's faces covering plant diversity, abundance, nutrients, structure, and distribution. I want to talk a bit more about distribution because this is a, a really fundamental ecological interaction that occurs with phase change that, that um, has really important downstream implications. And um, there's a ton of data supporting it. And uh, it's probably not getting as much of attention as it deserves in terms of implementation in um, predictive modeling and management. So all habitats are not created equal for a lot of reasons when it comes to their propensity to generate gregarious phase locus. Um, but one of the more fundamental components of habitat that does directly contribute to gregorization is habitat structure in terms of resource distribution. So there's these green dots here represent, let's just say individual plants. There are 16 here and there's 16 here. So the same exact abundance of resource, we could say that these are identical in quality um, as well. Um, the only thing that differs here is their distribution patterns. So one question people often ask, like if you get interviewed about locusts is how do they come together in the first place in order to change phase, right? They're, they're initially, you're telling me they're solitary phase, they're repelled by other insects. They don't wanna to go towards our conspecifics. How do they come in contact with each other to change phase in the first place? This is a very um, likely mechanism for that. So if you have initially solitarious insects, let's say there's 16 locusts here, all in the solitarious phase, um, they're repelled by conspecifics. So they will distribute themselves accordingly, uniformly, much like the distribution of these plants. But if those plants are distributed in clumps, which is a very common pattern in nature, aggregated resource distribution, then the locusts that need to use those resources are going to be aggregated on those resources, right? those resource patches, right? And this is where the initial contact can take place. And then of course, as, as the habitat changes, say after a rainfall, habitat begins to dry out or the food begins to, to be consumed, the, the distribution pattern further changes and concentrates the distribution of those resources, further aggregating locusts and, and um, sort of setting up a positive feedback loop for additional phase change. And so um, I'm not gonna spend any more time on it, but there's just, there's a lot of evidence out there from a bunch of different studies, both in the field, in the lab and simulation studies, suggesting that this is really a fundamental ecological component that interacts with the behavioral phase changes like we're talking about to, to promote gregorization in the field. Um, let's talk about mechanisms real quick. A couple highlights of mechanisms of behavioral phase change. So this is a uh, 2001 paper here. Um, this diagram is depicting the results of what is colloquially often referred to as the tickle experiment. So the way this experiment was conducted is they had individual solitary phase locusts in little cages and some humans went in and systematically stimulated the surface of the body of the locust with a paintbrush, um, but restricting it only to specific regions over time. And then as they did these experiments, they would take the animals and run them through that behavioral assay. And what they found is that the only animals that gregorized, right, that shifted from the solitarious phase to the gregarious phase were those that had been tickled on the outside of the femur or, you know, a little bit on the outside of the, um, the, the, the middle metathoraxic leg here, but mostly it was the outside of the femur. So overwhelmingly, the majority of the insects after stimulation, consistent stimulation of the outside of the femur, would turn gregarious. So they now had a, a localized region on the body of a locust that was integrating tactile stimulation that was invoked as a causal factor of behavioral phase change. From this point, they went on to examine the neurobiology underlying that. So those mechanoreceptors on the surface of the femur um, innervate nerves, of course, in the locust nervous system. 
And in fact, they innervate nerve five right here, which ultimately goes to the metathoraxic ganglion. So we've got some folks in the BPRI who are well-versed with chopping open locusts and pulling out um, different components of, of the nervous system. Uh, this is just a diagram of that. What they were able to do is then electrically stimulate the nerves of these locusts in the absence of any stimulus from conspecifics and show that yes, that was in fact a sufficient Gregorizing stimulus as well. So they had a direct path now to the neural circuitry that was underlying behavioral phase change. One of the next major experiments that came out then was looking at the role of neuromodulators and in particular serotonin um, produced in the ganglia after being stimulated, right, as a result of, of touch with conspecifics. And so um, here's again the, the images from the assay. In this case, I, I kept this figure in to show you how rapidly in this experiment um, they were able to Gregorize. So go from, from solitarious phase to gregarious phase, right? This is P Greg on the Y axis, and this is time. They were able to get animals within four hours um, that were fully gregarious, but some of them were even exhibiting gregarious behavior within one hour. That's a very rapid time course of Gregorization, but it, it is in principle possible. So what did they do here in this case? Well, um, first of all, they extracted the ganglia from these insects after different periods of crowding and, and looked at serotonin um, that had been produced in these, in these tissues. And they showed that at about 24 hours after crowding um, or lasting only 24 hours, sorry, after initial crowding, but lasting only about 24 hours, there's a transient pulse of serotonin production going on in the thoracic ganglia, okay? But then it goes away. So there, a lot of the media picked up this story and said, oh, locusts are, they got, they're coursing with serotonin, no wonder they're happy and gregarious. That's not the case at all. There was a brief pulse of serotonin in the thoracic ganglia, and then that led to further downstream um, changes for protein kinase K, for instance, implicated in, in promoting um, um, a whole cascade of other gene expression changes involved in phase change. Um, really cool stuff they did though, is they were able to block serotonin action with, with receptor agonists or um, blocking the, the locust ability to produce its own, um, its own serotonin. And when they did this on solitary animals and crowded them, those animals would fail to Gregorize, right? So that's additional evidence that they needed this serotonin pulse in order to, to um, enter the gregarious phase. And they did the converse experiment as well. They injected serotonin or they used what are called receptor agonists, things that bind to serotonin receptors that aren't really serotonin. And when they did that to, to solitary phase animals that they did not crowd, those animals still shifted towards the gregarious phase, right? Without any stimuli from conspecifics. So again, really good evidence that it's, it's processes going on in the metathoraxic ganglia a neural processes that then mediate the, the further downstream expression of, of behavior and then of course other phase changes. So just a couple things to wrap up before we try to power through a few other concepts in, in phase change. Um, we've talked about a, a brief highlight of some of the, the mechanisms um, in gregaria, which is one of the focal organisms that we're working on here in the BPRI. But it's super important to recognize, to know that there are, we already know there are different mechanisms in other taxa, right? There's different mechanisms in terms of the, the, the body surface that can be stimulated, for instance. In, in the Australian plague locus, it's the antenna. It's not the outside of the femur. Um, in low custom migratora, we know that different neural modulators, serotonin does not appear to play the same role in locusta as it does um, in schistocirca. So there are differences in neuromodulators. So we do not assume that the same thing is going on for all locust species. Within our chosen model system, Schistocirca, there's very little mechanistic work so far on anything other than, than Schistocirca gregaria, okay? So when we're starting to look at all these different species, I've, I've put in here, it's important to check your assumptions. I'll give you an example of that from our very own Dr. Song. Um, did a really cool study just published in, in 2021. 
in my opinion, I'm not kissing his butt too hard here, but I think he got robbed. I mean, this paper, and I helped him, you know, I, I read it a few times before they submitted it. I had much higher hopes for it. Uh, I thought they should have got a nature paper, so they got scammed. But anyways, they looked at, at gene expression between long-term crowded and isolated um, locusts. They looked within these four species here that exhibit a, a um, continuum of, of phase change in behavior and color, for example. Um, here's those reaction norm diagrams again, like we, we talked about um, at the very beginning. And, and what they found is that kind of at first what you might expect, which is that, yeah, the, the, the animals that express the more extreme density dependent changes do show a larger number of differentially expressed genes, right? So the, the, the extreme phase animals are changing, um, differentially expressing more, more um, genes relative to those that don't express very extensive phase polyphenism. So that kind of made sense. But then when they asked, what are the genes that are differentially expressed and are they shared, right? Is it, is it that, that these are a subset of, of, of the ones that are expressed by this species, right? And so on. Turns out that that's not the case. They're, they're different sets of genes that are expressed in these different species. Now, importantly, if you look at the, the functions of those genes, the functions are conserved but the actual genes underlying that are differentially expressed are not the same from species to species. And so I put up here related species, same mechanisms, right? And that seemed like, yeah, I mean, it seemed like a pretty safe assumption, but it just, this experiment alone blows that right out of the water. So a really cool result. Okay, let's spend the last few minutes talking about collective movement. Um, I'm probably gonna blow over a few things because um, in the sake of time, but, um, locusts exhibit swarming behavior, right? When we talk about locust swarms, there's the classic flying swarms in the air, but there's also migratory bands that march on the ground and people refer to that as, as swarming as well or marching. Um, this phenomenon is not limited to locusts. Again, much like what we're talking about with phenotypic plasticity, it's, a, it's expressed by, by animals throughout the animal kingdom, right? Fish schools, um, herds of wildebeest, flocks of birds, et cetera. Um, these are all examples of collective movement. And there's been a revolution in the study of collective movement over the past 20, you know, 25 years or so. Um, and, and the whole field of collective dynamics has really exploded. And so when you see these groups of animals like a locust swarm or, or a fish school, um, sometimes it's, it's easy to think that maybe there's some uh, guiding principle that they're, you know, driving the group forward, or they they all have, uh, you know, some some one desire to go behave as some group in unison. But really, what we're finding out is is that's not the case at all. There there are properties of these groups that look wonderful and coordinated, but they're really the result of very specific local interactions and local information being shared just amongst a few players in the group. Okay, so they're an emergent property, if you will, or they're examples of self-organization of, uh, so where we get these complex group level patterns, um, but they're really, they're really the result of simple behavioral interactions. So a lot of times these things are studied with computer simulation models, but um, there's also attempts to study it in the field. And I'll give you a few examples of those in locus. So these are just our pictures, right? This is Looking up close, all these locusts, they're all going the same direction. Um, this is what we might see um, from, from a bit further out. So the example though that I wanted to throw in real quick is about checking your assumptions. These are Mormon crickets. This is an old video, but right now we got really big outbreaks very similar to this going on in the Western United States. Mormon crickets do more or less exactly what locusts do. They march in these directional migratory bands, this collective movement. Um, looks an awful lot like a locust migratory ban. So you would be forgiven to assume, perhaps if you wanted to, that, well, Mormon crickets must express behavioral phase change just like locusts do. I got ahead of myself. These are some older pictures, but um, these, these signs are out again here. These signs, these pictures were originally taken like 20 years ago, but they rolled them, they, they rolled them back out and wrote the same messages on them in, in, uh, in Idaho and other places that are having big outbreaks right now. They warn people about the uh, slippery um, crushed cricket guts on the highway as cars are going past. Um, but getting back to phase change, um, 
Mormon crickets march in migratory bands, locusts march in migratory bands, but it turns out that Mormon crickets don't express any evidence whatsoever of a density dependent behavioral phase change. So I did the experiment, reared them under isolated and crowded conditions. There's no effect of rearing density whatsoever on their behavior. So what's going on? Well, we were able to, to address this in the field with the use of radio transmitters. So each warm of cricket's about as big as your thumb. We could glue some, some radio transmitters on them and then track their behavior. And we did an experiment where uh, we had Mormon crickets in a migratory band and we glued radio transmitters on them. But we also had areas nearby where, where migratory bands had been, but currently were not present. And we took individuals down here, put radio transmitters on them and released them at, at much lower densities um, in this habitat and also track their behavior. And we replicated this experiment several times. What we found in terms of their movement was quite telling, right? Those insects that we put back into the migratory band, they just kept going. The, so each point um, segment of these lines represents a single day's movement. So they were moving very long distances and all going in the same direction. But those individuals that we took out of the group and released at much lower density um, uh, down the road, that all broke down, right? They moved much shorter distances and their directions were, were more or less um, at random. And so that told us that that distance and direction of migratory band is a group level property, right? It's not that the individuals, when you, when you, when you release them, will go ahead and keep walking the same distance in the same direction. The direction and distance that an individual walks is, in, is, is result of the interactions that it's having when it's in a, a group. So it's not, doesn't have to be phase polyphenism involved for an organism to be able to express a behavior like that. All right, I'm gonna just wrap up here. I'm not gonna show you this stuff. I wanna finish with this. Okay, studying collective movement. How are we doing it right now um, in the BPRI and why are we doing it that way? It goes back to another seminal paper in locust biology. So this is a, a 2006 science paper. Uh, what we see here is, is an arena. It's uh, roughly a meter in diameter. And those are uh, Schistocirca gregaria nymphs that are in the arena. Um, this did not come from the 2006. This is one of Adelia's videos. Um, I put it in there as an example, but they use the exact same um, experimental setup in this particular experiment to study um, uh, the effects of density on locust transitions from, from um, non-marching to, to collective movement or marching. How did they do that? And why was this paper so important. I mean, I honestly think this is one of the more important papers in animal um, behavior in the last, um, you know, couple decades easily. And the reason is, is not just because it's cool locust work, but it's an outstanding example of the interplay between modeling and, and real um, organismal um, experimentation. And so what they did is they modeled, first modeled locusts in silico, right, in a computer, but they modeled them as individual particles. Basically, they took a gas model, a model called a self-propelled particle model used to, to measure the movement of, of molecules or, or atoms in gases. And they gave them very simple behaviors about being um, repelled or attracted to, um, to other um, organisms and, and movement behavior, of course. And it was just a one-dimensional model. But what they varied with, with these particles that were expressing really simple behaviors about attraction and repulsion, they then systematically increased the density of those particles. And what they did is this y-axis uh, measure right here is alignment. That's, that's um, how well aligned a given particle is to the direction that its neighbor is moving or its, its average neighbor is moving. And so if you're, if you're perfectly aligned, you have a higher value um, in one direction. Um, if you're perfectly aligned in the opposite direction, you have a higher but a negative value. And so at low densities, the alignment's kind of all over the map for the particles, right? For the modeled particles. But as density increases here, these, this B figure is an intermediate density, we start to see periods where, where the, the particles start to align themselves and all go in the same direction. And then the system might break down and then they go in the opposite direction. And then the system might break down, but then they'll start going in, in the opposite direction. But as they increase the density of particles, more and more interacting simple agents in the model, 
Soon they got to a point where they were all just stuck and going in one direction. So it's just very aligned unidirectional movement. They then replicated that same experiment with locusts. So again, they, they varied the density of locusts that they put in one of those circular arenas that we just saw. And at low densities, there's no real alignment, right? It, it's all kind of all over the map. At intermediate densities, they started seeing some of that marching, but the system would break down. It would go from, from order to disorder, and then it would reorganize, and they would start marching again. But at really high densities, the locusts just got stuck in, in directional movement. They just kept marching around and around. And so they're able to show that, that the same behavior that we see in what we think are these really complex organizational systems, right? These swarms of locusts, they can really be explained by very simple models that are, are effectively just modeling um, two behaviors in a single particle. Really amazing, um, an amazing piece of work in my opinion. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over um, um, this part, but I just wanna give some credit where credit is due and bring it back to the BPRI. Um, now, based on what I've talked to you about individual behavior and collective behavior, um, hopefully it's helped focus a little bit on, about what we as a group here in the BPRI are doing and specifically what we're doing in the behavior component. So Adelia um, and I are working on the individual and the collective behavior component. We've got, of course, our six BPRI focal species that we want to work on. And on the individual side, we're doing that behavioral assay that we, I showed you how it worked at the beginning of the talk. Um, for all of the animals. And in fact, Hojin's done most of the work for us. So he's really made our life easy. And that's allowed us to, to really get going on comparing patterns of group level movement. And I showed you Adelia's video here uh, where she's clearly um, got the video uh, or got the insects marching in the lab and collected the video. But just recently, she and I visited the Max Planck Institute um, in, in Constance. And she really learned to implement this video tracking software. So this is an early day shot of her trying to get it work. But after a, a couple of weeks training with the Max Planck, um, this is what we've got. Bam. So she's got this software called Trex working very well where it can lock on any one individual movement. And then the software itself is outputting um, the, the respective movement data for all these individuals simultaneously. Adelia has kindly made a tutorial package for everyone um, in the BPRI. So this is her, her experience learning this software is going to be made publicly available um, on the BPRI wiki and, and anybody out there in, in anybody's lab who um, wants to conduct experiments like this could potentially use it. And, and thank Adelia for making a, even the, the creator of the program, um, Tristan was like, wow, that's really cool. That's what, that's exactly what we need. So uh, for instance, we mentioned NEMA, um, from ASU, she'd already emailed me and I know she wants to do some marching experiments. So this might immediately be a way that, that she could get trained up very fast on using software like this. Okay, well, we are gonna post this, um, this video. And so I went ahead and, and made sure that any papers that I specifically called out, uh, I've got the, the references in here for anybody if they, if they wanna go dig them out and take a closer look. So that'll be in the, in the posted version um, for everybody. Last but not least, Nobody asked, but if there's some interest, I could also give a lecture on density dependent color change. So there are, there are basically four studies on, on the adaptive significance or function of color change in locusts, and I've been involved in three of them. So I'm almost more qualified to talk about um, uh, density dependent color change than, than behavior. It doesn't need to be the next lecture, but if at any point that is of interest, I'll go ahead and volunteer myself to talk on that as well. Um, and that's, that's what we've got. Let's leave it at that. Anybody have any questions that I could maybe clear up? I think there was some stuff firing off in the chat, but I, I didn't um, read them. You want me to start there? I, I can just ask my question out loud. Um, I'm what do we think? curious. Who's moderating there... this? Should I just go oh. to the chat and see what we got? Uh, I think chat most of questions for June address. We can get it back to later as in Oh, there we go. How do yeah. we know cancellata and pisophrons evolve plasticity independently? It is, is it possible that it's derived from a common ancestor to all of Schistocerca? That's a great question. So let's go to Dr. Song's phylogeny as a reference here. Um, boom. 
Okay, so we've got, I think maybe this one would be even better. There we go. So we've got the phylogeny of Schistus circa. We've got the desert locust, which, um, you know, about 6 million years ago or so, um, colonized, was present only in the old world, um, colonized the new world, and then led to this adaptive, adaptive radiation here in the new world of all these different species. So we're assuming that that, that must have been a swarming um, form of, of Schistus circa gregaria at the time, um, that to, 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 to perform that mass migration event and come over and colonize. And that assumption is backed up by the fact that, that the desert locust has been observed flying over the Atlantic even in, in modern times. So it's not a, a completely implausible scenario. So then the question is, is what happened here um, as all these species speciated? If, if plasticity was the ancestral state, what happened in all these species before we got over to Cancellata and we got over to Pisifrons, right? So we know that, that these two species here, the swarming um, species in Central America and, and, and South America, they have independently evolved in a phylogenetic sense, but what's going on with their plasticity? And that's really a cool question that we are poised to be able to answer here, okay? So we need to know, of course, what the expression of phase changes, whatever the focal change is, um, throughout the course of, of this phylogeny, but there are several scenarios. And one that's, that's really interesting to think about is how plasticity evolves in the absence. So it could be adaptive, could be favored by natural selection um, and maintained by natural selection. But another scenario for the way plasticity could evolve is, is some of these species, um, they might never really reach densities that are high enough to express phase change. So that reaction norm might be present, but say for instance, they never reach high density. So those, those phenotypes are never expressed and there's no selection against them. So they can, they can do what we refer to as lurk as a, a hidden part of the reaction norm because they're not being expressed and therefore there's no selection against them. The only way there would be selection against them in that case is if there's a cost of plasticity. So if there's a cost of maintaining the molecular machinery for expressing plasticity and you don't need it to, to improve your survival or your reproduction, then there should be selection against paying that cost and plasticity should break down. So we're in a very unique position to be able to test exactly that hypothesis um, for the evolution of plasticity throughout all the genus, including the species, um, you know, leading up to, 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 the, to the swarming um, species and their ancestors. So great question. And we're, that's, that's one of the big goals of, of this particular project is to, to, to get at that. Do you have any, did I get it well enough or do you have any follow-up questions on that? No, nope. but I would direct okay. others to look into the Oh, Hojin already answered it. Yeah, but he had a different Thanks, answer. So I think both are, both are valuable. Excellent. There we go. I think we, I gave a much more long-winded version of that, but I think it's pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, uh, Britt had a question. Brit. Okay. And then Barani asked if it's, uh, Greg, oh, can you hear me? Britt had oh, a question. I just realized my volume was down. Sorry about okay. that. Now I got my volume back up. Britt, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I had posted a question in the chat. Uh, Hojun had mentioned that like at any point along the life cycle that an individual could be potentially Gregorized. And so I'm just curious if that is plastic across development, like are early in stars like more plastic and Gregorized faster or maybe late in stars are. I'm wondering if we know anything about like time to Gregorization. And then I'm also curious about like the adults transitioning that that strikes me as interesting. Just yeah, if my thoughts. They are, I agree that it's interesting. And, and in some cases, I don't know of the, the, I don't know if the experiment's actually been done to really give you the answer. So the, the time course of behavioral phase change, um, the workhorse of those type of experiments has really been the final instar of Schistocircor gregaria, right? So um, and as folks start to look at the time course of Gregorization or 
the time course of the loss of gregorization, solitarization in other species, it looks like there's definitely some variation among species. So again, just because we saw it one way in gregaria um, doesn't mean it's that way in, in all gregaria. And in fact, um, I think some people are even seeing differences in colony level rates of, of gregorization, um, you know, as they try to repeat some of these other experiments and saying, hey, we're not seeing it as rapidly maybe as, as, as this particular lab did. Um, the, the question about adults, to my knowledge, nobody has done a time course experiment in adults where you, know, you monitor their, their behavioral change um, on let's say an hourly basis. Pretty sure none of the original, um, the Simpson lab papers that were involved in the time course stuff did that with adults, but they did do, um, they did show that adults can gregorize very rapidly upon crowding. So you could take an animal that from birth was reared for multiple generations and under solitary conditions and never seen an animal before um, and crowded as an adult. And, and you can start getting behavioral phase change. You can also get um, um, changes in its progeny. So epigenetic changes um, that occur from relatively short-term crowding of the adults. Um, and then the, the, the progeny end up hatching, manifesting um, either behavioral or color changes um, that, that are more consistent with being the crowded phenotype than the isolated phenotype. So it, it still can be, at least in gregaria, pretty quick in adults. But I, I, I don't want to say if it's, if it's on that hourly, the same hourly time course or not. That's wild. <laughs> pretty nutty. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, it's, it's an amazing system. But from a, if you think about it from a, the adaptive significance perspective, the, an adult that had been reared its whole life in isolation, but suddenly finds itself in a crowd when it's mating, then it's, it's, it's making a, a, a sort of bed, if you will, that its progeny are probably going to end up in a crowd as well. And if it can give its progeny a jump start on expressing um, the, 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 phenotypes that are going to benefit it as, as it lives in a crowd, then, then presumably there, that's been, you know, favored by natural selection over organisms that, that don't get a jump start on, on expressing those traits. Is there any trainee would like to have a question because we are running off the time? Alexis, I see one of question from you from the chat. No, I think okay. Dr. Song answered my question. Yeah, okay. I was just going to say thanks. So I've been scrolling through the chat now. Hojin mopped up everything for me in the chat. I appreciate that. Say Greg, I think uh, um, can I quick make a quick comment? Great, great, uh, great talk. I kind of got a good overview of this field. Uh, I still have to read the papers that you listed as classics. I think I have not read them. So I think I'm in the same boat as a trainee. So <laughs> I think we all get to read that. So I have a quick question. So in terms of the, uh, the Tinberg and Spore question, the first question, the function, right? So why do you think swarming is important? What is the function of swarming? Um, so there's several that could potentially be, um, there, there's a lot of non-mutually exclusive potential benefits, right? So the first is that, um, you know, there's just general benefits of group living. Um, one could be protection from predators, the selfish herd. Another could be finding resources. So there's some, some pretty cool new um, 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 foraging work coming out showing um, what, what ultimately comes down to information transfer and, and social um, um, information transfer among insect, among individuals in the swarm where, where they individuals in a group are able to find um, resource patches more effectively than individuals wandering in the environment. Um, this, another possibility is, is being in a group and traversing these uncertain heterogeneous environments. Um, it sometimes could benefit the individual by staying in the group in case they don't make it to a favorable environment. They have conspecifics as a potential source of food to feed on. This is called the lifeboat hypothesis. Um, so there's, 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 and it's of course related to cannibalism, which was one of the components that, um, 
in terms of the behavior of collective movement, um, that, that there's a lot of evidence in terms of it being important as both a, a, an ultimate and approximate mechanism, but that was one of the things that I blew over for, for lack of time today. Um, so the other aspect, of course, of, of long distance migration is colonizing new, new um, habitats and finding new resources. So I think a lot of these things are, are, are non-mutually exclusive and probably all operating either simultaneously or at different times. Cool, thanks. Pleasure. All right, well, I thank everybody um, for your attention and you know where I am or how to reach me if you if you have any questions and um, just I, I consider I'm not a religious guy, but I consider myself blessed to be working with all of you guys on such a cool, big and fascinating project. So um, keep up the good work. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. The recordings and the presentation will be available to everyone. I will try to get from the presentation from you and share with everyone. Thanks for everyone for your time. All right, hey, uh, while we're on here, Tanya, it's a pretty massive file. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you want me to compress it or you just want me to? Just send it, I will compress it and uh, share with everybody. Okay, I'll probably have to send you a Google Drive link. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, sounds okay. good. Okay. All right, see you later. Thank you.